Hello and welcome to Game Honest's Weekly, your one-stop shop for video game news, keeping up with the biggest stories so you don't have to. I am your host, Janet Garcia, and today we're talking about Cyberpunk's return to the PlayStation Store, Bethesda being sorry people are upset, and Everwild's issues. All these stories and so much more on today's episode. Now, I do want to acknowledge the fact that an episode just came out, so yep, this week is a twofer. I want to be able to touch on the stories that weren't specific to E3, but sort of happened around that E3 cycle that may have otherwise gotten buried. So this episode is doing just that, and we will be back to just the regular cadence of uh, weekly episodes, starting with episode 25. I did have some internal debate on is the E3 episode a numbered episode? Is it a bonus episode? We're just going to keep it rocking with the numbers. If we're out here putting out content is getting a number. So welcome to what I believe is episode 24. Let's jump into it. Let's start with Cyberpunk being back on the PlayStation Store. I, for one, am really shocked by this. I didn't think this would happen for quite some time. Part of me wondered if it was ever really going to happen. I mean, I didn't think they'd get the game to a state where PlayStation would want to have it on its store. And from the sounds of it, based on the fact that it's couched on, hey, if you play on PS4, you're probably going to experience issues. We recommend you playing on PS5. It sounds like it's not really up to par still, which again is surprising. I figured it would be not only are you going to take a long time to come back to the store, but when you do return, it was going to have to be you pass with flying colors there. It's it's a really strong, powerful, well-rounded build in the sense that, you know, bugs are really minimal. Performance is good across the board. And it doesn't sound like it's quite up to that. So, um, yeah, I was really surprised to hear that it's back. But I'm guessing the PS4 version is at least better than it was before. I'm interested to see outlets cover this, do technical comparisons, and really start to dig into, hey, in what ways has this really changed? And is that change significant enough to justify this return to the store? And at first, this was just sort of unceremoniously relisted or like researchable, but not really available for purchase yet. Um, but I did get the PR release that I'm going to read from now, a few hours ago, actually, at the time of recording this on Monday. And it says, Cyberpunk 2077 is available on the PlayStation Store. CD Projekt Red announced that the PS4 version of Cyberpunk 2077 is available for purchase worldwide on the PlayStation Store. In addition to the game being on PlayStation 4, anyone who purchases the game can also play it on PS5 via backward compatibility. Furthermore, a free PlayStation 5 upgrade for the game will be coming in the second half of 2021, which is coming up. Uh, that part was me, not the press release. I will continue. And will be available for all owners of the PlayStation 4 version of Cyberpunk 2077, both digital and disc. The upgrade will allow the titles to take full advantage of the new console's more powerful hardware. And then there's an asterisk that says users may continue to experience some performance issues with the PS4 edition while CD Projekt further works to improve stability across all platforms. Playing on PS4 Pro and PS5 will provide the best Cyberpunk 2077 experience on PlayStation. I guess this is good news, right? It's back. That's inherently good for people like the developers and people to have purchase options. But, you know, I can't help but feel sort of mm, about the whole thing. I mean, I think recommending that you play on a pro or a PS5 was not very far off than where we already were at when it got delisted. But maybe that gap really is significant enough that it's negligible compared to other games that are for sale on the store. It just I'm really surprised to see that drop specifically with that asterisk. So definitely let me know if you now plan on either picking up or returning to Cyberpunk on PlayStation 4. Or of course, if you have it, PS5. As most people expected, Starfield is exclusive. That was sort of confirmed with E3 and it being rolled out as like, hey, this is a Series X S and PC exclusive game. Since then, people have couched it as Bethesda coming out and apologizing for the exclusiveness of Starfield. But I think that's sort of a little bit not completely accurate, especially in follow-up tweets. So let's go ahead and dig into this story. This came from GameSpot's interview with Pete Hines. And for this, I'm going to pull from Matt Kim's write-up, which refers to that interview. Uh, Matt Kim over at IGN.com, of course. And in that interview, Pete Hines says, if you're a big fan of stuff we make and a game that we're making is no longer available on your platform, I totally understand if you're unhappy or pissed. I get it. Those are all real feelings and frustrations. 
I don't know how to allay the fears and concerns of PlayStation 5 fans other than to say, well, I'm a PlayStation 5 player as well. And I've played games on that console and there's games I'm gonna continue to play on it. But if you want Starfield, PC and Xbox. Sorry, all I can really say is I apologize because I'm certain that's frustrating to folks, but there's not a whole lot I can do about it. However, later on Twitter, as this in, there's an embedded tweet here that sort of contextualizes uh, things a little bit more. And that tweet says, I'm not apologizing for exclusivity. I don't have to do anything. Some of our fans are upset slash angry, and I'm sorry they are. That isn't wrong or weird. It's acknowledging how they feel. That's it. That's my whole point. So I find it funny that like some outlets, you know, uh, justifiably so are saying Bethesda or Pete Hines or however they're counting it, apologize for Starfield being exclusive. And then Pete Hines is then like, oh, I never apologize. Like he literally says the phrase, I apologize. But really to me, this is more just him saying, you know, I'm apologizing, but I'm not sorry, which is funny to think about from a semantics point of view. But I mean, I think he touches on a lot of things that are important to discuss. You know, ultimately, this is a decision that they made for their studio and their product, their piece of art. And it made sense to them from a business standpoint. You know, potentially there was uh, elements of creative standpoint where that's also justified. So I think you just have to respect it at the end of the day. I mean, I totally understand. And I think that's what Pete Hines is getting at here. People being upset or frustrated or feeling like they were, you know, cast aside or not accounted for or not included after having you know supported for so long i can understand how that is a point of frustration but ultimately i think you have to you know leave it to the devs to do what they want to do with their game for their team for their projects because at the end of the day i think it's really important that i think we can still be you know critical of developers for sure but i think ultimately they are the ones making the games that make this you know whole thing go around and we need to have their back as as fans i think that's really important and I also think we need to give our props to Microsoft. I mean, there are people who will say like, oh, this acquisition, it's them just buying out, you know, their exclusives. They're not really like fostering the creativity. But again, this is the whole thing is a business. Every element of this is a business. E3 is just a bunch of trailers, a bunch of, you know, glorified advertisements. I think it's totally fine for us to be excited and even enamored by some aspect of the creative elements that go into making a game. But ultimately, at the end of the day, it is a business. So yeah, I think Pete Hines here saying the phrase, I apologize, is sort of what people are running with. But really what he kind of meant to say was, I feel you. Like, I get it. Like, I understand. I see you and I get it. Next up, Everwild is having some issues. This comes from Andy Robinson over at Video Games Chronicle with the article titled, Why wasn't Everwild at E3? It's been completely rebooted. Subhead says, sources suggest Rare is starting from scratch. Studio confirms new creative director. The article reads, the original IP was a notable absentee from the Xbox and Bethesda showcase on Sunday, especially considering Rare debuted new trailers of the game at each of Microsoft's previous two big events, the Xbox Game Showcase last July and XO19 in November 2019. And according to our publishing sources, it could be a while before fans receive a significant update on the title and even longer before it releases. VGC understands that last year's departure of creative director Simon Woodroff, first reported by us, has led to a complete overhaul of the game's design and direction, as well as significant changes to its senior leadership. According to people with knowledge of Everwild's development, the game's design has been essentially restarted from scratch, which means it will likely be several years before it releases. This corroborates comments made by journalist Jeff Grubb in a video this weekend in which he said he'd heard Everwild's development was taking longer than expected. We're told that Everwild's development team is now optimistically targeting a 2024 release and that Rare's most senior creative employee, designer Greg Mails, has been brought in to lead the reboot. Everwild's executive producer, Luis O'Connor, confirmed Mails' appointment in response to an advanced copy of this story. According to people familiar with its development, Everwild's small team had struggled to define a clear direction for the title beyond its striking art style and soundtrack. As of last year, the game was a third-person adventure with god game elements, we were told. One person said that, in particular, a mandate from Rare's leadership to not have any combat in the game has led to roadblocks in the design. And yes, it's true, this game looks like totally beautiful. It's described as unique and unforgettable experiences awaiting you in a natural and magical world. And I'm just in love with the creatures, the art direction, and in general, I have a lot of respect for Rare's games and enjoy a good amount of their catalogs. So the idea of this new IP coming out from Rare was really exciting. I know a lot of people are really hyped about it. But yeah, I mean, 
it sounds like it's going to be a while for this game. And I'll be really curious to see what kind of game we actually end up getting by the time it comes out, because it says that they're, you know, really struggling to figure out what the direction is and exactly what they're doing with this game. I think it's totally possible. And a lot of people are speculating that the game that we're going to see, you know, in the language of rebooting is not the game that we've seen before. So it's like, OK, if it's a different game with the same name, like, is it really going to, you know, conjure the same excitement? Now, obviously, this is all uh, this blow is softened by the fact that you know, we haven't played this. Who knows what it was going to be? I mean, it seems like they didn't even know what it was going to be. Like, obviously, there's problems there with the studio trying to get its footing in getting this game, you know, made. But I think the initial idea and sort of the, you know, the concept and looking at these sort of spirit like animals that emerge from the forest, all of it had this really like fantastical and striking look to it. And I think it is a bummer just to hear that they're struggling so much with getting this thing developed. So TBD on when we will hear from this game again. And while some games may be beginning, others may not be ending. Metroid Dread producer Sakamoto doesn't want the series to end, promises a, quote, new episode. This comes from Matt Kim over at IGN. And the speculation of Metroid ending comes from the fact that they said this would be the conclusion of that story. So a lot of people were wondering, OK, well, if this is the final chapter, what does this mean? So this is what Sakamoto had to say in regards to that. Quote, so regarding the end of the Metroid saga and the five part saga, the Metroid story until this point has dealt with Samus's strange fate that's been intertwined around this being called the Metroid, Sakamoto explained. And until now, that has been the focus of the series. But what Metroid Dread represents is a bit of a pause or kind of a new start to something else. He continues by saying, nobody wants the Metroid series to end, and we know that. We ourselves don't want that either, but we just want people to know that there is some kind of new episode that is waiting in the works, and we want you to look forward with what we do with that next, but there are no specifics now. You already know I'm a huge fan of starting new things and continuing on, but I also think that like, when we think of Nintendo games, we often think of really strong, long running IPs. So I have no qualms with the Metroid continuing. I think they can do a lot more and I think they will do a lot more. Um, I don't know, you know, the speed and the cadence for those things because Metroid historically hasn't, you know, sold super well compared to other of their like really big marquee franchises. But there's a lot of love for Metroid. I'm hella excited about Dread. So, yeah, I'm down for more Metroid now and forever. Not that he necessarily has forever in mind. Forever is a pretty long time, but it is really cool to get confirmation that, hey, ending the storyline does not mean that the saga, like the franchise itself is over and we don't want it to be over, which is also really rare to even get that confirmation. I think that alone is actually a pretty uh, interesting get and something worth noting if you're a fan of the franchise. Shifting gears, PSVR 2 is rumored to come out next year during the holiday season. This comes over from Bloomberg, and this whole thing is part of a much larger report in which it mentions the Japanese console giant sold more than 5 million units of the original PSVR, launched in 2016, and is aiming to release the successor in the holiday period next year. The people said, asking not to be named, discussing internal plans. Bloomberg is obviously a pretty reputable source. That does not mean that's guaranteed to be true. Plans change. Things happen. A rumor from a good source is still just a rumor. But yeah, if I had to bet, I would buy into this personally. I think the timeline makes sense. And I'm personally excited at the effect that that's not like terribly far away. It's not super soon, but it's not terribly far. Obviously, PlayStation has been ramping up the PSVR hype, even just with their random like today's VR day. And they'll just on a random Tuesday tweet out a bunch of VR games. So yeah, pretty cool intel. And hopefully if that date is true, we hear more about PSVR in a more you know, detailed, practical, hands-on type situation, even if it is still through our presentation, just doing a deep dive into the machine is going to be exciting. And hopefully that comes sometime then early, mid next year, like a PSVR 2 state of play. And continuing with PlayStation news, you can sign up for the first PS5 system software beta program. The blog post detailing this states, you can register for an opportunity to join the first ever PS5 system software beta program at, and then it gives you the link. Again, head to the PlayStation blog for that link. Registration is open to players over the age of 18 in the US, Canada, Japan, UK, Germany, and France. By signing up, you will be among the first to put new features to the test and provide essential feedback that will help guide their development. 
If you're selected to be part of the program, you'll receive an email with instructions on how to download the beta version of the Next System software. In order to sign up, you'll need a PS5 console with an internet connection and a PlayStation Network account. You will also be added to the potential participant pool for future PS5 system software betas automatically without having to register again. After the beta begins, you can restore your system software to the latest official release version before the beta program ends. Our last major PS5 update in April introduced new features like USB extended storage, cross-generation share play, an improved game base, and other UI enhancements and social features. We'll share more in the coming weeks about what you can expect in the beta for our next update. It's not as exciting as like new games and things, but I genuinely get really into these little updates. This quality of life stuff, yes, it's small, but it's the potential death of a thousand cuts when it is annoying. So anyways, they can improve, fix, streamline, enhance the PlayStation 5 experience I am here for. And of course, it's always cool to get the public involved in getting that feedback and testing out those features as well. So yay for more PS5 updates, and here's to many more during its life cycle. Moving on to game events, releases, and updates. The Medium, previously exclusive to the Xbox Series X S, is going to be coming over to PlayStation 5 on September 3rd, and it will take full advantage of the DualSense. I played a good amount of this game. I still have not beat it. It's kind of been my white whale. I just have not made the time to go back to it. And personally, I found this game to be a little bit more on the mediocre side. It is sort of this like adventure game, a little bit has that horror element to it, but not super scary. I think if you're not a horror person, you can still play this. It did some really interesting things with like dual reality in terms of puzzle solving. And I think some of the like environments are, you know, really genuinely intriguing, but some of the I don't know, some of the story elements didn't hit. It had some of that mandatory stealth that just wasn't, just didn't play that well. And uh, yeah, I'm, I'm, I am genuinely curious to see the story through and watch it play all the way, which I think is at least a testament to creating at least that level of intrigue. But yeah, this one was more of like a mixed bag for me. It's like the best of the not great games I played, but the worst of like, if we're looking at the actual good ones I've played, but still cool it's available for PlayStation players because it wasn't before and it's coming to retail as well. And lastly, for the shut up and take my money section, a quick shot to the Xbox mini fridge coming out and becoming a thing, but it won't be releasing until holiday 2021. So I'll talk more about that when it's actually up for sale or pre-order, however they're gonna handle it. But something that you can do is customize your controller. Xbox Design Labs is back. This is so exciting to see. I'd been waiting for this for since they took it offline, honestly. I just think it's such a cool and unique feature of, you know, the Xbox ecosystem. And I've always loved the Xbox controllers uh, since jumping in on the Xbox One, which I know it's only spanning two generations, but still a fairly young player in this space. But yeah, you can go ahead and go to their store and order now and you can get it as soon as July 20th if you're ordering, you know, around the time of this episode. So not like a crazy quick turnaround, but not too long of a wait either. I actually don't have a second Xbox Series X controller. However, since you can play with the controllers from the Xbox One, I'm sort of like, ah, oh, I don't know if I'm gonna do this yet, if I'm gonna wait. But I would like to eventually make a custom controller for sure. And those are all the stories from this past week. Again, you can check out the E3 roundup over on the last episode of the show. Thank you so much for watching over on YouTube. Be sure to like, subscribe, tap the bell, and for listening on podcast services. Make sure you're also subscribed. And if you could leave a review on your podcast platform of choice, that would mean a whole lot and help the show a whole lot. And as always, a big thank you to my patrons over on Patreon. You too can join Patreon over at patreon.com slash gameonesis. We got rewards from as low as the $1 tier to as high as the 25. And as always, I will see y'all here next time. Bye.